Hey, what's up? Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to grow a church in the 21st century, part two. Now, like, that's has to offer. Hey, what's up? Welcome back. My name is Chris Abbott, but all my friends just call me Abbo. And in this video, this is actually part two of a two part series. So don't worry if you haven't seen part one, all of the things we're going to be talking about in this video can stand on their own. And you can always go back and watch part one after you do. So let's dive in and talk about three things you can do to grow your church in the 21st century. All right. So number one, the currency of heaven is people. Now, why are we starting with this one? Well, it's because I think a lot of times we get so focused on trying to grow our church, trying to reach more people, trying to get new people in the door, that a lot of times it's easy to kind of lose perspective of the people we are reaching, right? So every single person is a gift from the Holy Spirit. So it's important to remember that whether they are a new visitor or whether they just started coming a couple of months ago, or if they've been here for 20 years, every single person is a gift from the Holy Spirit and we need to treat them that way. Even the people that are a little hard to treat that way. Larry Osborne has a book called Sticky Church, and in it, he talks about a principle that really convicted me, right? So he talks about tools versus sheep. So he talked about the early days of him trying to grow his church. One of the mistakes that he made was he started treating the people in his church like tools instead of sheep, right? So what happens is he was trying to grow so much, and he was trying to reach new people, and had such a heart for evangelism, right, and reaching people in the community that he was using his people as tools to grow the church and to reach their friends. So he's constantly telling telling them, hey, you know, uh, invite your friends to church and, and, and doing all these different things to try to bring people in the door, but he wasn't treating them like a gift from the Holy Spirit. He was treating them like a tool, right? And so he talks about the importance of treating people as sheep, not like tools. When I was in full-time ministry and I was a youth pastor, I fell into this same exact trap, right? So it was easy to, you know, be focused on the different high schools that we were trying to reach and getting people in, right? I had two wrestlers that came from one of the large high schools nearby. You know, they came out, they got saved, gave their lives to Jesus and started bringing some of their friends, right? So every Sunday at first it became like, hey man, what time's y'all's wrestling match? I'm going to go there. And it was actually pretty cool. They actually invited me out to become the home wrestling announcer of that high school. So I actually became the wrestling announcer and announced all of their home wrestling matches, which is pretty cool. But what happened was once it became familiar, I started constantly treating them and even some of the guys they've been bringing as tools to try to reach the rest of the guys on the wrestling team and some of the guys on the football team and the basketball team and the baseball team and other people that were inside of their high school instead of treating them like sheep. And so I became convicted reading this and I realized that I had to recalibrate and I had to focus on those relationships and discipling those guys. And a lot of it, the natural overflow of discipling those guys and raising them up to be leaders in Christ, they would naturally invite their friends. All right, number two, uncompromising integrity. Now, I think integrity is a huge thing in the church, and a lot of times it's easy to kind of gloss over this one as well. It's like, okay, yeah, like we're Christians. Of course, we have character and integrity, right? But uncompromising integrity means making the hard decisions and doing hard things. So one of my favorite examples of this is the Navy SEALs, right? They have an incredible manifesto. They call it the Navy SEALs ethos. And so I wanted to read that for you right now and understand this is what the Navy SEALs are dedicated to. And I think we need to take a similar approach, especially in uncompromising integrity in ministry. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the entire ethos, but let's take a look at a couple of my favorite parts. I serve with honor on and off the battlefield. The ability to control my emotions and my actions, regardless of circumstance, sets me apart from others. Uncompromising integrity is my standard. My character and honor are steadfast. My word is my bond. We expect to lead and be led. In the absence of orders, I will take charge, lead my teammates, and accomplish the mission. I lead by example in all situations. I will never quit. I persevere and thrive on adversity. My nation expects me to be physically harder and mentally stronger than my enemies. If knocked down, I will get back up every time. I will draw on every remaining ounce of strength to protect my teammates and to accomplish our mission. I am never out of the fight. Brave SEALs have fought and died, building the proud tradition and feared reputation that I am bound to uphold. In the worst of conditions, the legacy of my teammates steadies my resolve and silently guides my every deed. I will not fail. <laughs> 
So I absolutely love the paragraph about uncompromising integrity. That's where I got the idea for this point in the video is I think that idea of uncompromising integrity, right? The Navy SEALs say, uncompromising integrity is my standard. My character and honor are steadfast. My word is my bond. I think some of those have become kind of lost core values that we need to revisit. And I think it's important to be able to put this into everything that we do, not only as leaders, but even as we are leading the people in our church. I think one of the most important things when we're talking about integrity is to predetermine the outcome before it happens, right? So you need to think through some of the leadership challenges that could happen and predetermine the decision that you're going to make before it ever happens, right? So for example, when I was in college, I remember one of the Christian ethics classes that we took, my professor said, hey, would you take money as a pastor from a member of the mafia knowing that it was blood money? Right? And at first you think, well, yeah, I mean, we're going to use that for the gospel. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Let's go. Right? But over the years, it's something I had to think a lot about. Right? What if you know that money came from a drug dealer or that money came from someone who stole it or someone who earned that money in kind of a gray area? Having an unwavering commitment to uncompromising integrity is really important. And we need to think through a lot of these situations before they happen. So when they do happen, we know exactly how to respond. So people with character and integrity are attracted to other people with character and integrity. And when you are doing everything with uncompromising integrity, one of the things that's going to happen is your light is going to shine in the darkness, right? So I remember I worked in restaurants for like seven years when I was doing youth ministry, right? Not all the churches could always afford to pay me. And so I would hustle slinging Chinese food during the day so that I could hang out with youth kids at night, right? And one of the things that was really interesting is people who were the biggest sinners out of the entire restaurant would come up to me all the time and say, dude, what is it about? you man you're different why are you happy all the time why are you always singing like why are you in such a good mood people aren't like that right and it always gave me an open door to be able to talk about Jesus and the gospel and how God had completely changed my life right it was the integrity because I wasn't out there screaming and cussing and getting mad every single time whenever I got stiffed by a table or whenever things didn't go my way and the things that were normal people getting upset about that and talking about customers behind their back when they heard me not doing it it stood out and so I ended up becoming really good friends with some of the other Christians because like attracts like right and then a lot of the guys who didn't have those types of integrity were actually attracted to that and opened up a chance for me to share the gospel the exact same thing is going to happen with every single leader, whether you're a pastor or a business owner, when you commit to uncompromising integrity. All right, so before I get to my last point, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. We're dropping brand new videos, fresh content every single day, five days a week. And finally, number three, never stop learning. The moment you stop learning is the moment you stop leading. I recently heard it said that if you're not currently involved in the hardest thing you've ever done, then you're not growing, right? And the more I thought about that, the more I think it's absolutely true, right? We have to constantly make ourselves uncomfortable by learning new things and becoming new people. And we have to constantly play at the edge of our ability in order to expand our capacity, right? So if your leadership is at a six right now, the only way for you to lead people who are sixes, sevens, eights, nines, and tens is for you to level up your leadership. Because if your current level of leadership is a six, you can only lead one through fives, right? So you have to constantly be learning and growing and working on your leadership in order to bump up to a seven or an eight or a nine in order to be able to lead people down from you because you can always lead down but you can never lead up so never stop learning because the moment you stop learning is the moment you stop leading and this is really important when you're trying to reach new people increase your impact and grow your church because as Jay Abraham said people are silently begging to be led right people are looking for leadership in a storm so as people are going through stuff in their lives they're looking for leadership and so the more that you can constantly grow and continue to level up your own leadership, the more people you're naturally going to reach because people are looking for leadership. Hey, so if you like this video and you want to learn more strategies on how to grow your church and use social media and technology, we've actually got a free video for you. Just click on the link in the description below. Head on over to churchgrowthagency.com. You can check out the free video that we have over there. We'll see you soon.